Today on Not Rod, we make big power with a little 289. So to give you a little bit of background, this is a 1967 Mustang that me and my dad restored. He got it finished, and just a few weeks after he finished it, he died. In fact, it was actually the last car that he drove on the way to where he died. So this car holds quite a bit of sentimental attachment for me, and I try to keep it in nice shape. It's been sitting at my mom's house in her garage for several years now. I moved out away from where she lived and didn't have the room for it. But now I've got it back home at my place. It's got a 289 with Windsor heads, a monstrous cam. The engine was built by the previous owner, so I don't know the exact specs on it. It's got a Performer 289 intake manifold. Supposedly it's got pretty high compression, like 11, 11 and a half to one, something like that, according to the guy that built it. And he said it made about 400 horsepower on the dyno, which is quite a bit for a little 289 like this. And I believe that it has solid lifters because you can pull it to 7,500 RPM and it is still pulling. And well, the lifters make a whole bunch of noise just like a sewing machine. But one thing that I noticed after sitting so long is that it has a real bad hesitation when you open up the throttle. And I found that looking at the accelerator pump lever, if you work the throttle with no fuel in the bowl, it'll push on the lever just fine. But if it's got fuel in the bowl, it doesn't really want to push on the accelerator pump lever and you can just see the spring compressing and it's not really pushing any fuel out of the nozzle. So the first thing I'm going to do is change out the nozzle because I think the nozzle might be clogged and that's why it's allowing air to move through the nozzle, but it won't allow a liquid to push through it. That looks better. So I think that's going to be a success because now you can definitely see it squirting fuel out of the discharge nozzle really well. After changing out the accelerator nozzle, it got more responsive, but then it started backfiring through the carb. I got that fixed by adding some timing to it. It still has a hesitation when you step on the gas, but it's much improved from what it was. So right now I'm going to move on to trying to figure out why it won't shift into third gear and go back to the hesitation later. My first test is to make sure we have vacuum at the end of the hose that plugs into the vacuum modulator on the transmission. That checked out good, so then I changed out the vacuum modulator itself. And we're leaking all over the freaking place. And since as soon as I pulled it out of there, it started leaking everywhere, I'm just gonna go ahead and reuse the seal that was on it. And now I'm gonna take it for a test drive. So you can see when I stab the throttle a little bit, it really wants to hesitate. Just like that, it just basically completely dies when you stab it. But if you roll into it, instead of doing that, it'll actually continue pulling. So what that tells me, the idle circuit, the transfer slot, and the boosters are doing their job, but it's the accelerator pump that needs uh, an extra shot.
So after taking it for a test drive, it still wouldn't shift into third gear and I couldn't figure out why. So I hooked a hose up to the manifold vacuum port and routed the hose into the car so I could monitor manifold vacuum while I was driving it and see what it was doing. So then while I was driving it, just for kicks, I decided to take it up to like 70 miles an hour just to see what it would do in second gear. And then at about 70, it shifted into third gear. And then after that, it shifted in and out of third gear just fine like it's supposed to. So I'm gonna declare that a victory on the tranny. And now I'm gonna go back to working on the accelerator pump and see if I can get that right. Hey everybody, we wanna thank each and every one of you for watching our show. And if you feel like showing some extra support, head on over to our website, notrodshop.com, and check out our store. We've got shirts, hats, hoodies, and more. Now enjoy the show. At this point, I started shooting at everything I could think of to try to get the dead spot to go away. I tried just about every possible combination with a 30cc pump diaphragm. I used every pump cam you can try in multiple different positions and finally stepped up to a number 37 nozzle with a hollow screw, then tried more combinations of pump cams and that still didn't fix it. Ultimately, I bit the bullet and ordered a 50cc pump kit. Now I'm sure a lot of you out there are like, dude, it's just a little 289, why do you need that much accelerator pump? Well, I'll tell you why. The reason is precisely because it's just a little 289. It has itty bitty cylinders, but it has a huge cam, huge valves, huge ported and polished heads, way too big of a carburetor, and a spacer between the intake manifold and the carburetor. And what all that adds up to is little itty bitty cylinders that take a long time to build up a vacuum in that intake system. The boosters require a vacuum to pull fuel through them. So while the cylinders are taking their sweet time building up a vacuum to pull fuel through the boosters, the engine needs an alternative source of fueling, i.e. the accelerator pump. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the 50cc pump in there. Honestly, the best way to fix this is probably to put a smaller carburetor on it, but it runs really good at high RPM. I mean, aside from when you're just pushing on the throttle quickly, it runs perfect. So I'm gonna put it in there and we're gonna go from there. So just to make sure we're really starting from ground zero, well, I'm changing to the 50cc diaphragm. I'm also going to change out the jets in the main circuit because they've been sitting for a while and they can be corroded and have junk in them. Get some fuel squirting out of there. That's kind of how it works. When it pushes down on that diaphragm, it squirts fuel up through the discharge nozzle. Now the Hall A 50cc pump kit does come complete with a diaphragm. However, the material is just the black diaphragm and that uh, will get deteriorated with ethanol fuels, um, which a lot of gas stations have ethanol in their fuel now. So it's best to use this diaphragm that has this kind of a turquoise color. This is safe to use with ethanol fuel. Kit also comes with a new spring and a new housing that is thicker than the old housing. All specially designed for this larger diaphragm. And when you put this gasket on with this style of uh, little black plastic thingy in here, you have to make sure that this goes on first and then the gasket goes on top of it. I made the mistake earlier of putting the gasket on and then putting this on top of that and then when you put it all together this black plastic thing can just fall right off of these alignment tabs and it'll fall right down behind the float and then it holds the float down and then the whole thing just spills over with fuel and floods the engine. And there's different profiles of cams you can get. I'm just going to jump right to this big guy, the yellow one. And that's special for the 50cc diaphragm. This brown one that comes with the 50cc kit is also special for the 50cc diaphragm. The brown one puts in a little bit less fuel than the yellow one. And to be honest, if I could make this thing 
shoot in too much fuel, that would be a huge step in the right direction just to see how this is going to work. And then I can always scale it back to this brown cam. They're really easy to change out. It's just one screw. This is the cam that came off the carburetor. It was a little bit worn right here. But you can see the different profiles if you line these up. This pink one doesn't give as much of a pump shot at the beginning right here, but it gives more back here on the tail end as you're opening up the throttle a lot more. I've found that it's best to have a good pump shot at the beginning because that's normally when the engine is sitting at idle and, and really needs it because it doesn't have the vacuum to pull through yet. You can see this blue one is the biggest one you can put on there for the 30cc diaphragm. Now you can use any of the 30cc diaphragm cams on a 50cc, it's just it'll only give you a 30cc shot. And really it's actually only a 3cc shot and a 50cc is only a 5cc shot because the way they rate them is how much fuel is pumped in with 10 full strokes of the pump lever. Now we're going to go ahead and put this lever in. Make sure everything works good right now. There's no obstructions. Okay, so the 50cc pump diaphragm was a huge success. This thing runs great. There's no more dead spot anymore. When I first pulled this thing out of my mom's garage, it smelled like death. I mean, like rat pee. It was musty inside. It was awful. But now, this thing smells like nothing but wind. It is great. It runs good. It sounds good. It does great burnouts. I can't wait to drive this thing some more. But of course, there's a little catch here because as soon as I got all that working right, the transmission and the engine and everything, the heater core got a crack in it because it was leaking fluid on the floor that was green. So now I gotta change that out and then we can go drive it some more and do great burnouts. All right, so I have never actually pulled the heater core out of a 67 Mustang before. Some cars are easy, some are difficult. Super Duty trucks are real easy, but, you know, this obviously ain't a Super Duty truck, so we'll find out. Oh, that's not good. I busted some of the, looks like fiberglass, yeah, I busted some of the fiberglass on that one. But this didn't have one, so I could move it over there, I guess. So I'd hate to completely destroy this box. And then find that there is a different way to take it apart. You know what? We'll just consult the Googles. <sighs> okay, glove box. Well, that gives us a little more room. Okay, so this is really weird. Normally, your heater core hoses would attach to the heater core outside the firewall here. So apparently the hoses have to come out through the firewall with the heater box, which, boy, that's pretty dumb. All right. Now that is the beauty of a base burger car. If this thing had been ordered with AC, this would have been a pain to get out of here. But because it's the base model with just a heater, it was basically four bolts going through the cowl and one bolt going up onto the dash and then the two heater core hoses and pff, this thing came right out. And now the nice thing is we can rebuild it on the bench. There it is. So here's another thing to check while you're in here. If your heater only runs one speed, it's probably because one of these resistors is broken. And in this case, this resistor was broken. So I'm gonna replace that resistor while we're in there too. So I wanna check the length on these lines. Same length, it looks like. So that means that it's supposed to be like this where the hoses are actually clamped inside the car where you can't get to them. So if you blow one of these hoses, you're screwed. You have to pull this whole box out just to change the hose. That's pretty dumb. Hmm. That's really dumb. I'm going to check and see if they make a heater core where that's not the case. Okay, so just as I suspected, they actually do make a heater core for this car with extended tubes. So I'm actually gonna send that one back and uh, order up the one with the extended tubes. 
line that off. Okay. And next item, change out this resistor. Ah, oh, stuff smells like the inside of a garbage compactor. There we go. Uh, now, I'm gonna tape up this box a little bit. Probably should have just ordered a whole new box. This is in pretty rough shape. It's already been duct taped and stuff, but whatever, I didn't. So we're just gonna rebuild it. All right, well, it ain't real pretty, but this stuff all goes behind the dashboard anyway, so you'll never really see it. In hindsight, I probably should have just ordered up a whole brand new box, but it's like 200 bucks, and I'm already so far into this thing, I'm just gonna go ahead and use it. Okay, so this is the difference in these two heater cores. Old one, short tubes, new one, long tubes. And the really cool thing about that is when these heater core hoses deteriorate sometime in the future, I'll be able to replace them without having to remove the entire heater box again. Okay. Okay, this thing is RE built and ready to go back in the car. Poor man's rebuild. Here we go. There we go. So this is what I was talking about. Those tubes being on the outside of the firewall like that are gonna make it way easier to hook the heater core hoses up. But what having those tubes sticking out of the firewall means is that in order to clear the engine, our hoses have to have a little bend on them like this. So I got these preformed hoses so that we can do that. Otherwise, if you don't use those hoses and you just use a regular straight one, it'll kink right there where the engine is and it won't flow any water through it. So my plan is to try to get this hose all the way up against the firewall because the old hoses kind of sealed that up. So I'm gonna use some caliper grease on the hose and on those tubes so that I can try to get this thing worked up there as far as I can. A little bit of caliper grease in the cooling system shouldn't hurt nothing. And it's blue, it matches the color of the car, see? Pretty cool. So I just happened to find this little guy in my parts bin, which will help to hold those hoses up and prevent them from falling down into the headers. Thinking ahead for the very first time on the show. Put that in the record books. So the accelerator pump was a huge success. So don't always assume that just because you got big cubic inches that you need a big accelerator pump, or that because you got small cubic inches that you need a small accelerator pump because it may very well be exactly the opposite. I pulled the air cleaner off over there by the uh, gas pump and saw that it was dumping a bunch of fuel in through the carburetor. So I think it's just a stuck needle in the seat. So I'm just gonna tap on it real quick and see if I can fix it. This is how you fix any Holley carburetor. We're not using this to take it apart. We're actually tapping on these guys here. We're good, just a stuck needle in seat. A few wrap a tap taps, fixed it right up. All right, we're moving. Oh, this car is a ton of fun to drive. Dad did a real good job on it. So, the trick to driving an old car on a hot day that doesn't have air conditioning, roll down both the driver and passenger window. 
And then, of course, put your arm out. That's, that's a must. Then there's that. Back in the days of manual brakes, you used to actually have strong legs. Otherwise, you couldn't drive your car. Well, you could drive it, you just couldn't stop. Still not one to idle very good. I'm not sure I got the needles actually fixed. We'll see here. We're just about to Brandon, so I can throw a new set of float needles in it there if I have to. Oh yeah, she's smoking. Running a little rich, aren't we? So since I installed the uh, heater core back in it, this thing has actually sat for a couple of months and now the needles are sticking. But I'm at Brandon's and he just happens to have a couple, so we're going to swap those out real quick. Oh, whoa! Cleaned it out in here. Yeah, I picked it up a little bit. I had a couple of days off at work and I just came out here and it's just one hand and stuff. <laughs> back ones seem to be working, I think, but we'll change it anyway. What did the old ones look like? I think the back one was working, the front one didn't seem like it was, though. You know, there's some junk in it. That'll do it. So, I'm going to crank it, and then uh, if a bunch of fuel starts coming out of there, tell me not to crank it anymore. <laughs> okay. Whoa, whoa. We're getting... Sparks going from the coil up to here. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty good size arc from here to there. Too bad. Got a spare uh, wire? <gasps> coil wire laying around? I don't know. That's female and female? Yeah. I'm just going to take all your parts today. <laughs> well, we'll see what I got. I have all the ends and boots. Okay. Hey, we got that other coil too. What's that? Got that other coil too. Yeah, if we want to, if there was something wrong with the coil, we could swap that Honestly, out. Honestly, this one looks kind of shitty. That might even be the problem. Ooh. I don't think that's snapping in like it's supposed to. Yeah, and this end went up here. Right? Oh, wait, turn around. That's, that's a spark that's plug. That's a spark plug end. It's a spark plug end. Yeah, that's the wrong end. Okay, I did not make this wire. I did not <laughs> assemble this on there, okay? This has been on there for a long time. Sure. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> That'll work. Okay, we're going to make a wire. You got crimpers? No. No crimpers. I've got all that stuff, once again, at home. Nope, you have to... Do it the old-fashioned way. Well, I've done it that way before, so... Do you want to throw this new coil in anyways? Yeah, I suppose we could. Okay. If you want to. Yeah, I can do that. I think I might as well. The Mustang is deserving of it, so... Yes, it is. This was for the Mustang, too, I think. See, this was my whole plan. If I came to Brandon's, I'd get a bunch of free parts. <laughs> That's funny though, because guess where this came from? Oh, from me? It, was, it came from you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it, so I'm actually just getting my own parts back. <laughs> this was actually in a box full of Mustang parts, and you tossed a bunch of crap, and this was in there. I was like, whoa, don't toss that. And then we take a pair of pliers, which is not what you're supposed to use for this. Crimp it like that. Let's see if we can get it to... And that's the nice thing about an actual pair of crimpers, is that it does all of this in one step. Okay, there we go. Now Brandon's changing out the coil. And then when he's done with that, we'll slap this on. Watch, we're going to find out there's a reason that this coil was in the box and the other one was on the car. I know, but take a gander at that one. Yeah, this one looks pretty ratty. Is it not fitting in there? No, it's not going in enough to 
hook. Yeah. All right, we'll swap that with a straight. <laughs> hey, we'll get it one of these days. Yeah. I don't know how many tries it's gonna take, but eventually. Ah, those wires are always a pain in the ass. I don't know if they always are, but they certainly are when you're working with uh, the incorrect tools and... Maybe that's always the case for me. <laughs> because I hate doing them always. Oh, I, I didn't say I didn't hate oh. doing them. I <laughs> well, certainly hate doing me, them. They give me hell every time too. Okay, check for sparkies. Ah, your front is way high. I just don't like to go too far with them because you can bend that tab on the float. Yeah. We got a fire extinguisher nearby, maybe? Well, I don't. Hey, I drove all the way here with it like that and with an arc and uh, plug wire. Maybe so. blow your ass up. I'd call that good. Good? Okay, cool. Yep. Perfect. That sounds pretty good. It's dead. The car just died. Yeah. I don't know, it started losing power, running worse and worse, and then finally yeah. it just died, and I think I found the problem this time is we got a clogged fuel filter. You know, it's not very often you have two problems in the same day that are exactly the opposite of each other. One was overfueling, the other underfueling. <laughs> now we're just waiting on the side of the road for a fuel filter. Here's the scary thing is I'm pretty sure I already replaced that filter. So if the new filter clogs like that one, this thing's gonna need a new tank. If I didn't replace it, I'm pretty sure I've at least had it off of there. It'd be kind of strange to take it off and not replace it, but, but. See, like I said, we're just going to be driving and doing burnouts and stuff. We're not going to be working on the car today. <laughs> Look at that. We got a filter. We get the hand tight. Yeah, we'll get her get her tight just a little bit to, tighter than that, and then. I know this thing's blowing a little bit of smoke. I think it's seen 7,000 too many times. Yeah, probably. I think the valve seals are shot. Oh, yeah, that could be what it is. Might have to give her a freshen up one of these days. Yep, new valve seals and set the valve lash. Yeah, see now I think the, uh, the idle's probably too fat now. See if you adjust things with faulty parts. You get a faulty adjustment. Okay. <laughs> oh, I love this thing. Okay. Looks the corner's pretty good. I'm pretty happy about that. Better than say a 72 Nova with slicks on it in the rain. But once you get everything fixed and you finally get out here, you're cruising the back roads, 
going around some corners in the shade. It feels pretty good. thing about this car. The last time my dad laid fingers on the body was almost 20 years ago. And since then, I've always been heartbroken to do anything else to the body that he hasn't done. I mean, I haven't even finished putting the emblems on the side that say Mustang yet. So this thing is just essentially a time capsule from almost 20 years ago. But now I'm really excited to maybe get back to work on it, maybe finish the body, at least try to make it what he wanted it to be, which isn't far off from how it is now, but with a few little tasteful things just finished up. But at least now, mechanically, the thing is sound. Well, we did a little bit of driving around today. We did a little bit of repairing on the road and she's working good now so <laughs> I guess all that's left now is just do a proper burnout oh hey where'd you come from <laughs> did somebody say burnouts they sure did <laughs> Bunch of coconuts, deedly dee. There they are, standing in a row. Big one, small one, some as big as your head. I need you to go potty.